In the space of a moment, the fleeting, flickered peace that lasts until the slivers of pain jumpstart instinct, and we are again forced to submit to the truth of mortality. We are here, and it hurts. Old ghosts enjoy tea on the side of mountains while the body resides in a valley. This is what happens when you die, they say. Nothing is ever really what it seems. Another breath in, like not even trying. Another breath in, it just happens. Another breath in, until it doesn't. And then when the last breath has been breathed, then eternity begins. Hands like shovels, he's always the pack mule, traveling along, alone, all except the whip and the guy holding the whip. Boys will be boys is solid, repeated enough by now, but eventually a boy has to admit he done wrong and become a man. I've already seen our children's eyes, and I've already held you up before you sunk into abyssal depths, and I've already grounded you when your ego took flight past the Milky Way. Dreamt it, but woke in a cool sweat because it's not the same vision as yours. Just another conquistador, you're waiting to make a story out of me. It seems landscape, it mystifies everyone here. They've all forgotten how the stench from the iron forge on Twelfth and Cherry carried with it the stink of the hopeful will of paychecks, which made even drunkards worth a lick of salt beating their backs in front of the ovens. Give me back my black Jesus and I'll share him with you in truth. The youth believe they're niggas and is flying and destroying our youth. Strange fruit we are bearing because they believe the lie. Black Jesus came to save us all, but the devil is still taking lives. So, hip hip hooray! Here's poetry to say. And I recommend we roll around in it as if our graceful phraseologies were mud and we are pigs. If they talk too much They tell us it hurts them a little more We cannot tell if they make this up We've never stood in their shoes In their skins In their heads In their shirts What is a poet? An unhappy man who hides deep anguish in his heart But whose lips are so formed that when the sigh and cry pass through them, it sounds like lovely music. And people flock around the poet and say, sing again soon. That is, may new sufferings torment your soul, but your lips be fashioned as before, for the cry would only frighten us. But the music, that is blissful. So saith Soren Kierkegaard which is just an excuse to show off my philosophy minor. <laughs> but what is true is that in poetry and through a poet, we can take the mundane and the existential and deliver it to the masses, to allow people to feel and think differently, to see the world through eyes that see the world with a different perception. We say with the average person would be afraid to say. They call us crazy. Manson's long lost babies, love child, poets rarely smile. Inner inadequacies, flaws beating us down, sadness stretches for miles. We express our grievances on paper. People either love us or they hate us. We try to make life, not settle for what life makes us. There are curses on poets, no one knows this. We carry mental weight of emotions. Frowns camouflaged by smiles. Poets are sometimes lonely. I need. I felt like I needed to to get my feelings out, but um, we were taught that children are meant to be seen and not heard. So um, there wasn't a lot of communication going on, and the only way I felt like I could vent was to write. And then when I wrote, it felt, I felt a lot better. And 
I could get my feelings out and not be judged based on it because when I was writing them down, people wasn't really paying attention to what I was writing at the time. It was just me, the pen and the paper, and I could write. And um, the funny part is I would never read the stuff ever again, though. I would just ball it up and throw it away. <laughs> Every community has their private stories, tragedies, successes, and glories. Sometimes you have to keep from drowning if your environment is, this poem title is Public Housing. Where I live, dreams are thrown by the wayside like the trash which isn't important enough to make it to the dumpster. Where I live, children play outside, ignored by parents who are too distracted by their own lives to pay attention to their precious investments. Only a prerequisite of how the world will treat them when they grow up. Reminded that they are a product of their own environment which their media has created. They televise us as no ambition, pants sagging, lazy, uneducated Negroes. Well, that's what the media says. Where I live, opportunity presents itself by knocking on doors, leaving post-it notes like FedEx, saying you didn't answer it fast enough in time to receive it. Where I live, we are told that we can buy our freedom within a capitalist system built on the backs of our slavery and oppression. If we are willing to do better for ourselves, one of the many lies the devil tells. Where I live, we work hard to be broke. Minimum wage barely pays the bills, and neither does it pay for our overseeing talent and ambition. Where I live, troubles are gray clouds sprinkling rains of hardships on the undeserving and innocent. Some of us were born here. Some of us don't belong here. But all of our lives' predicaments landed us here. Where is the exit sign? Where I live, where I live, this is where I live. I, I write for myself, but I found out when I when I write for myself, it seems to 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 help other people. Um, it, it it seems like it communicates to people because honestly, I, I never really originally wrote or did poetry or anything to to have anybody else hear it it was just meant for me but as I started writing and um believe it or, how, believe it or not Poetal was my first experience with ever letting anybody read any of my writing I know I know you're up there you're probably up there in heaven humming God's ear off but he understands he knows all too well about the songs you sang and the origins of which they come. Those tunes which makes me cringe and say, Grandma, they make more hip gospel music now. Haven't we made it past the wait in the water days? Due to my youth, I failed to realize that these tunes my grandmother sing were about her ups and downs, about her good days and bad days. Some songs she made up didn't rhyme. Some songs were too damn long. Some songs didn't make any sense at all. Well, at least to me at that time. She loves you for your name. Adores the idea of just having you. Her pitch rises and the corners of her eyes turn up to match the corners of her lips from which letter sounds leap out of with joy. Daddy. She knows you, even if she's seen you just once in 14 months. Even if you spent that one time trailing behind us with trembling hand, and it was for but one hour because that's how long you could spare yourself a drink. Daddy, you depart with best wishes, but daddy's kisses and cologne are reminiscent of natural ice. She'll forget your face and voice, but carry your eyes while I carry keys to a broken home, and that was my choice. I should have known better than to choose you 
who she remembers and loves and misses but doesn't know why. So you're finally here. Your mama couldn't do it, huh? None of these men who were supposed to replace me were good enough for you, boy. Didn't they tell you that I'm no good, boy? Didn't they tell you that I'm a sinner, even a monster? I've broken all the Ten Commandments at least twice. And I'm sure they even told you that I beat your mama. Well, I can see you've got a whole lot of anger, son. Maybe you want to fight someone. Well, if you want to fight somebody, here I am. Your mama been busy trying to make life pretty for you because that's her job. I was the only one who could come between the two of you and my job was to support your mama and kick your butt until the day that we could say to everybody that no one can kick this man's ass. But you didn't come here today to get your butt kicked and I did not come here to kick it. I came here to tell you that I love you. I didn't tell you this before because I even hated myself. And nobody gave a damn about that. They all just tried to kick my ass. Look, your mama and I not being together, that's got nothing to do with you. That's grown folks business. And when you really get yourself a woman, then we can talk about it. Everyone has experiences as a child to really get them to see how they fit in to their family uh, at large. And for me, um, my grandfather uh, is a, is, uh, he was a uh, World War II veteran and he was in this place, this soldiers and sailors home for a number of years towards the end of his life. You would go in and you'd go to talk to him or see him or something and he wouldn't recognize you immediately but what he would do was he would refer to you as somebody that he knew from when he was a child. So I got to get to know <laughs> You know, <laughs> previous generations of people who looked similar to me uh, that he recognized in my face. And that was one of the more, more early kind of mystical experiences I remember having. As much as I didn't like coming up here in the sense that there were a lot of people in their last stages of their life, there was a lot that I, that I got from my own sense of purpose and my own sense of life, my own sense of connection to larger things in my life by coming out here. And this is certainly a landmark for me in Erie, Pennsylvania. Bigger and quicker men have tried to do what you need to do now. Few of them have done it. But one thing you've got that they do not have is that you are mine. No matter what they told you, what I've done, no matter what I've actually done, all the best parts of your father and mother were put together to make you. And I love you. When you look at all the mess of your life and Dig right down to your deepest self. You will find everything that you need, no matter what they say, no matter what you've done. You are still the man that God made you. And if the universe did not want you, you would not be here. Son, get up. You have a purpose. Find those things that give you life and hope, and at last become the man that all of your haters deny you to be. But don't do this for them. Don't even do it for me. Do it for yourself. I love you, son. The trouble with shoes, that they come untied. You might take a fall down the stairs, and a board might come along and say that just like life, I think the trouble with boards is they'll see boards be everywhere. I am inspired all the time by different things and different events. Um, poems come to me in a lot of different ways. Uh, I could be reading the newspaper and a lot of my social justice poetry comes right off and it leaps off the headlines of the pages of the newspaper. Uh, sometimes I will see something or an interaction between two people and I will get, and it's almost like an internal um, street sign, and it will give me an idea that there's the title of a poem. In Erylea, the war goes on, first gone on sea, then paved beyond. Once British crave the right to seize the waterways, trade with ease. Now dealers sweep with scores to rail between brick homes where crack prevails. 
and bullets fly in steady streams to deplete their stores of magazines. Cruel crews drive by from dusk to dawn, Detroit disposed to flood the lawns with blood-soaked teens and mothers' cries, their breasts ache where a nurse bodies died. Once British craved the right to seize the waterways to raid with ease, we meet our current enemy, and they are still ours in ear and hand. The experience of living uh, lends itself to me, you know, rolling the words around until they fit together into what strikes me as a beautiful musical line, and then I just feel the need to capture that, transcribe it, work with it a little bit, and share it. Do you rewrite a lot? No, no. I'm more of a of a kind of a first take guy. I I I. I try to, to kind of hear it well and then transcribe it. So it's, it should be pretty much done by the time it's written down. There are steps to the process where it can be reviewed. Uh, so the, the first task is to get it written down. Don't be a man without a heart. All that noise just bats, bats screaming bats when in fact music such music be not a fool make that playful move if a red guitar turns out to be too big try a red scarf <laughs> or a mandolin stop worrying already enough of that when cold, bony fingers start squeezing your heart, remember, laugh. <laughs> there is no other way. I will write poetry several times by hand, a poem or a series of poems by hand. I write all my poems by hand before I enter them into and I key them. And that's when I really start looking at uh, placement of uh, line placement. but. It's a, it's a combination of the two. Anybody that just says they're inspired and throws a poem down, um, they're, they're very gifted then if they can do it at that level. I think that poems develop, but some people take it to an extreme too and they say they work on the same poem for seven years and they have to end just at an interesting place somewhere. On Good Fridays Gone By, Dad took us to noon mass Stood us in line, one by one, we kissed the foot of the cross with the rest of the believers. And again, we stood in line to get a nail for our pockets to remember those pierced into Christ. Then home for more reflection of the word. No radio, no TV, no play until sometime after three. But he found reflection in the sacred act of spade to soil, digging dirt, to add a sapling to the yard. After his sip of schlitz, his head bent in homage to the tree. If you tell somebody you're a poet, they, number one, they think that you write about flowers and sunshine, <laughs> number one. Or some people are like, oh, the opposite of that. Like, you're like Hamlet. You're this dark, brooding person. You know, you're just super emotional and whatnot. And then everyone, the next thought, the next immediate thought is probably more or less like rhyming with hat, like Dr. Seuss kind of <laughs> rhyming. So you're kind of going up against all these preconceived notions already. Sometimes I'll take elements of def different art styles, totally different forms of art, and I will say, how can I use this in, and, and make it be like a poem? Or how would this director approach this topic? Or how would this potter go about doing this thing? You know? And I think that really helps because um, you know, if you can get outside your own mental box when it comes to doing whatever it is you're doing, and it doesn't matter if you're an accountant or anything else, man, like, you know, having a, be, being able to take a different perspective or take a fresh look at, at something, uh, if you're not making any progress with it, or if you want, if you sincerely have a reason to approach something in a different way, um, it adds value.
know, to your work. It makes you more creative. It forces you to think different ways. He sits in his car. I don't know where he's headed, but he thinks of the phone sitting on the empty passenger seat as it slides. He thinks about normal forces and coefficients of friction, which he learned in the dull science building hallways with their constant stench of formaldehyde. The gray skies are just a backdrop to the world inside of his head. And I'm driving too through the streets of my hometown, which seemed a much more romantic and mysterious place before, before I learned to drive myself. Now I head down State Street and there's no Woolworths or movie theaters. It wasn't the way Dad described his childhood. And instead of places that little kids remember, it's corner stores with a turnover frequency that precludes even buying a sign or naming the store. But maybe they'll walk there with their grandmother on a crisp day where snow falls from the clouds but never sticks to the ground. And the few dollars she carelessly spends on candy drinks and comic books will seem like a fortune. And the store will never be forgotten even after the owners are not the owners anymore. The train that barrels to Buffalo is covered in graffiti Bored vandals and hopeful artists have no aesthetic requirement other than to make the coal cars look a little bit less like the car before it. A city like this has more relationship to what it is to be an American than living in a big city. There's more Americans live in small cities like this than any other place. The city also has a class identity, which speaks to, which feels like me, who I am. You know, when I moved here, I said, oh, this is fine. I've lived in this city before. So it felt like home in that sense. It's also an interesting city to me because it doesn't have the same sort of apartheid geography that other small cities do. There's, 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 there's a more black part of town than a white part of town, but there's not like the same strict dividing lines based on a whole side of town. Have you noticed that? So the whole east side isn't like all black and the whole white side isn't all white. It's not like that. So when I go to bars to play pool, for example, a lot of them are integrated. You know, like the bar that I play out of up on Parade Street on Western Parade Street. To me, that that's that's that feels more comfortable than say when I lived in Cleveland, which is like you, know, you cross that line from Cleveland Heights to East Cleveland, you know, everything changes. There is another Erie that I visit in my sleep. I've been there at least three times already, and boy was I shocked and disappointed to discover I was dreaming. This other Erie, it's intensely urban, thick with people and their buildings, where they live four, five walk-up stories above the well-worn streets. The first place there I went was on the east side, this was the shopping district. All kinds of stores, plate glass windows, women in furs, traffic, taxis. But the best part is also the most recently discovered. Apparently, I'm getting to know my way around the place, and I found myself uptown, uptown, around the edges of a big park with benches and pigeons. A park with cobblestones and trees and weeds and pavement where all the people from all the tribes were wearing knitted hats and scarves and blacks and reds. And the wind was blowing fallen leaves and music. Across the street, a row of steamy bars. One was the Heidelberg and it looked Perfect, a place for cabbages and beer delivered by beefy waiters wearing frowns and aprons. Couldn't see the parking lot, so I drive through the giant ruts of a nearby alley. Candy wrappers, Pop-Tart boxes, and a Lay's salt and vinegar bag decorated the scenery skipping the potholes, sometimes hopping, the smell of gummed up liquor bottles, sweet vermouth, too syrupy, peach schnapps, pungent, stagnant, thick smudges on my senses. Drafts, 50 cents, $2 cover, fruit flies hover, shots, $1.50, DJ's bass, obscene. 
people leaning in, yelling, can't hear. Money on the table, one hand, Willie's in the corner booth, hat tipped, with business in his eye, ready to run it with his own chalk and stick. A woman draped over the booth by the door screams, that's my song, when trouble man pours through the speakers. DJ sweats and grins at the old folks and their requests. Smoke curls around the bartender's lips. She's seen it all. Nightlife, judge, and jury, hesitant to serve me. Wanderer, not regular. Waltzing before dinner is what Matilda dreams of. Being from a disjointed era, far removed from the days when most people waltzed, she never gives much thought to anything other than where the next drink will come from. Her eyes are the mystery of an unnameable blue which refuses to color the oceans, giving them only the salt of broken days. She dances to nothing, no music, and you gaze at her graceful box steps, thinking her music is that sadness you start to hum. Our exchange was held entirely cheek to cheek. On the margin of a crowd pulsing to the kick drum, shouting salutations. Low murmurs of what we thought but never shared were to be heard but once. A flurry of words unwinds slowly when my lips brush your ear. Tired, has been fingers trace my jaw, hair, carrying my wandering mind and eyes in your direction. Those hands, those hands could build a home if your heart didn't linger 1,800 miles away. Swimming in a sea of rocks, glasses, and loggers, we bathe in amber light. Shining of truth and pain until it feels warm, easy, free. Before it all fades out to a blur. But check this out. Later, you'll claim amnesia and apologize for something that never happened. <laughs> Time is it don't go back Or maybe that trouble is with you and me We are so scared of that fade to black That we will push and we'll go And we'll do anything that will be free Alright, welcome Friends, members of the committee Citizens of Erie County To the announcement of the fourth Poet Laureate of Erie County. This initiative is really unique and has been a model for other communities around the nation. And what's important about this initiative is two-thirds of the money comes back into the community in, the ter in terms of projects to make the art of poetry relevant and public for our citizens. This is important because Erie is often known for the wrong things. Poverty, weather, unhappiness, algal blooms. But none of that really reflects who we are as a people. Everywhere's got problems. It's how we deal with them is what's important. And poetry is one of the ways we express, our, express ourselves, say what's wonderful about ourselves, deal with these problems, and make them beautiful. One of those messages of hope uh, is C. Williams in the work that he's doing over at Poets Hall. Uh, we on the east side are oftentimes uh, marginalized. Uh, and we get a lot of the bad publicity, uh, but there are, there are oases of hope that are springing up, and we all know that hope springs eternal. Uh, and of all the deficits that a community could suffer, uh, the greatest and the most important is a deficit of hope. So uh, not only to see, but to all the poets, uh, and all the spoken word artists, uh, uh, we really, really appreciate the things that you're doing on the east side. It gives me great pleasure to stand here with you. She's not only a, a um, 
member of the second legislative district. I also live on the corner from his mom. And so you know, I better say some really nice things <laughs> about him. <laughs> uh, they're a great family. We couldn't have a better poet laureate. We couldn't have a better representative. If you haven't had the opportunity to visit uh, Poets Hall, you should do yourself that, that favor and treat yourself. I promise you it'll be an experience uh, that you won't soon forget. Uh, so on behalf again of the, uh, my colleagues in the second legislative district, residents, uh, congratulations. I think Sister Lucille wanted to bring back the 1950s. She'd call me little Negro and tan my brown backside regularly. Almost daily, she'd smack my palm with her pointer Jenny, red curls, button-up blouse, training bra visible underneath, wanted to touch the afro. I let her. Jenny had a boyfriend, Adam, 16. Jenny had recently turned 12. Adam's lips are so thin. Jenny liked to kiss. I crack a joke I overheard about people with thin lips and slices of bologna. Jenny leaned in. Her curls smelled like peaches. Mother of God! Child, get to your room! And you, you little Negro, come with me. Sister Lucille beat me purple. Father Louis had to intervene. He warned me not to let it happen again, and then he swatted my sore backside once more for pious leisure. Back in the classroom, I stood beside the window, behind my desk, watching Jenny chew my gum. <laughs> I saw Hawk on my morning walk today, and I stared at him until he flew away. He was beautiful, this huge bird of prey, the size of a house cat. He had these amber eyes with pupils that appeared a bluish black, piercing eyes that seemed to watch me back. Handsome cream face, a yellow beak with specks of red and gray, long brown legs, almost orange in shade, talons sharp and black, wrapped round a wrought iron porch rail that decades back had been painted white. He took my breath away. And I didn't breathe until he flew. No, no, he sailed away. And right before he left his perch upon that porch, he raised up and he spread his wings. It was without a doubt the most majestic thing I have ever seen amidst these houses that are far too close together. You know, I don't know that I ever realized how much uh, uh, just, you know, sitting by the water, maybe, you know, just holding the pole or, you know, hoping something or bite or maybe, you know, it doesn't even matter if something's bite. It's just, you know, being on the edge of that body of water is, you know, is, is a big piece of tranquility and uh, uh, you know good lord there's not enough tranquility in the world I mean um, you know and just to find that little bit of it and, and maybe go home with lunch I mean come on who could ask for more the world the world is you know uh, the world's a cold place sometimes you know, we, we, we do some awful things to one another and you know uh, for me especially uh, with the, with the uh, uh, performance part of it you know I started to share because I needed, you know, uh, something tranquil like the fishing. And I found that there was a great deal of joy, not, not only in just writing the poem, but sharing the poem. And as the years have gone by, it's that joy that you feel with that completion of that poem and that sharing of the poem and that sharing of, you know, that, 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 that common bond that is, you know, the human condition, we all go through the same stuff, and that's, that's why poetry is so, so important. You know, it's the human condition. It, it, we're all just stuck together in this humanity. You know, no escaping it. And I wanted to tell him that just around the corner, there are a few acres of woods. The hunting should be good. Lots of rabbits, mice, and squirrels. There's an open field lined with evergreens so you won't be seen watching your prey forage through the snow. And as if the message had been sent, off he went. But he didn't leave without giving his audience a show. He soared off that porch, not, not towards the sky, but downward. 
And then right before his feet touched the asphalt street, he tucked them underneath as though to show me how he'll snare his prey. Still no air coming my way, he shot upwards, did a spiral, and glided over the houses in the direction of those woods. Sad to see him leave, finally able to breathe. I hope his hunt went pretty good. I saw a hawk on my morning walk today. He took my breath away. Yeah. You saw a hawk today. This morning on your way to work, it flew in ways that amazed you, dazzled you, silly, awed you, mentally you and it on the same page, a moment of beauty and gone. Me, I'm glad to know you're in tune, despite the city. How do I know? I know because I speak to the hawk. She speaks back. We talk in her language. I watch her train her young to hunt, then drive them off to their own hunting grounds. I have heard enough to distinguish her cry of glee and her lonely moan. I have stood still six feet from where she landed, catching a snake in her talons, taking off. The snake wriggled away, fell, slithered off, and she, she cried for the hunger of her young only but for a moment, and then latched on to something else that is not paying attention. She is crafty and wise, sees much further than I. Her daily views are awesome. She has invited me to fly with her. I do not respond. I cannot tell her I do not yet have wings. I can only speak to her from here, see her from here, this form, in the winter from my window, I see her house. She built a loft in the treetops where she will make it through the same winter as I and you without a furnace, without food stamps. The lessons of life she has for me are hard. They are lessons quick to learn or die, eat or starve, prepare or freeze, pick a good place to hunt, Build your house strong and insulate it. Help the kids to love freedom. Oh, and be nice to your neighbors. Communicate. I think it's a really beautiful thing. I believe there's more people like me who wrote for many years and didn't really come out and share it. You just, I just wrote for the page, and, um, and now since I've learned that there's a place to come out and share your poetry, and, uh, and what a good thing it is. I'd like to see more and more people come out and do that in, in the future. You know, what is it to Erie? You know, it's a good thing to do on a Friday night. Um, you know, it's something different. You know, it's a place it's a place to do something different. I mean, you know, turn off the TV and, and, and go hear someone's thoughts and be reminded that you're not in this, you know, all by yourself. You know, it's, it's a chill place. You know, it's not a bar where you got to deal with the, you know, the, the loud noise and the, the conversation that you can't really hear. You know, it's, it's, it's edutainment. So at the time, it occurred to me that the Erie bookstore might be a really suitable place for a regular poetry event. And I approached Kathleen Cantrell who we already knew each other from these special poetry events that went on, and she was agreeable. So the two of us co-produced, and I hosted Poetry Scene, that was the name of it, a weekly poetry event that went on for eight years. As a bookseller, it was always my pleasure to try to uh, give exposure to uh, new poetry books, and I was always happiest when they were by a local author, and we have such a rich tradition of published poetry here in Erie. It, uh, it is amazing, I think, for the size of the city, how much poetry there is here, how much poetry has been published by local authors. What I did was uh, provide a venue yes. uh, with the goal that anyone who wanted to read wanted to perform or wanted to just come and listen to poetry would feel welcome and comfortable 
in a relaxed atmosphere. That was, that was the goal. And um, the success of Poetry Scene for those eight years or so um, was due not to what we did, but to the poets. The poets made it happen. I walked in there, looked around, said, this ain't my audience, turn around, walk right back out. Five times, solid, at least five times. I, you know, one day I walked in there and I sat down and I stayed and I didn't read and I listened and I was like, all right, they don't seem uh, scary or that bad. They were pretty friendly. And I went back after a couple martinis because the martini bar was next door and I read a poem and it was the first time I ever read in front of like strangers and people and I was reading a piece. And in the piece, there was a rhetorical question, like, you know, like, so what now, right? It's the question, so what now, I remember. And then I asked it, and, I, and then when I asked what now, I stopped and I looked at a woman who I've only seen once since. She was in the front, and she looked at me and said, she didn't say it out loud, but she looked at me and answered no. That moment, I had that one moment of understanding with a stranger I had never met before. And I don't know how she applied it to herself, but I knew that she understood what I was saying. Never saw her before in my life. That was it. I was done for. I was a regular ever since then. Poetry scene at the Erie Bookstore. I just stumbled in there one day. The way I enjoy writing the most is just trying to keep up with how fast it comes. And it really feels like it's uh, a gift and it's something that you're not creating, that you're just letting it come through you. And you're writing as fast as you can keep up with it coming. Um, the poems that I construct, uh, you can almost tell that they're constructed. I don't know how else to say it. I, and I feel like I'm cheating if I construct a poem uh, versus just letting it come. And... Um, you know, some, some writers know what I'm talking about and, um, and other people have never experienced that. They just only construct things. This poem is about uh, one of the situations where you, you see something that's utterly familiar in entirely a different light. Maybe it's a trick of sun, maybe it's the way the clouds are throwing shadows, but suddenly you've never been on your own street before. I lost my way in the world today. They've lied to me. They've lied to me. These tales scholastically delivered. Only a clown could think the earth is round. It's not that. It's not even flat. Only a fool could believe that it's even all one piece. Your perceptions are not wrong for being yours. Believe the sense of your eyes, of your hands, the sun does rise, the sun does set, and winter is not everywhere. It is only a breath held in the shimmering fingers of an ice-bound tree. I lost my way in the world today. Maybe it was a chance step, a breeze. The sun on my face slanted strange, and all at once I had never seen my block before. The white house above so alien and inviting, the little brown cottage down the street Corners flattened by light. No surrealist could have created a more beautiful disorder. And I laughed at it. Children know the secret, and knowing they don't believe that the world persists when they close their eyes, they wake each day with surprise. Tyrants, trouble, tirades, terror. The war on has worn on for too long. Misguided, misdirected, les miserables, macabre, Operation Slaughter, protection from the cults of Mephistopheles to guarantee our freedom, our Western way of life. That's what I read, it's what the paper said. I was supposed to believe in the mission, but the terror, terror is in my city, the land, the trees. They are terrorizing the produce, the cattle, the chickens. They have patented seeds. Rivers and streams are tainted, the water isn't safe. They've terrorized the bees. My personal liberty is forsaken, but should I make mention of it? They terrorize my speech and that of my children under paradigms of an authoritarian, totalitarian regime. Core standards. I can band together with my constituents, yes, and they can charge me with a felony for mildly terrorizing the status quo. 
There goes my right to vote. They drop drones on innocent civilians, shoot dogs for frolicking, tase 80-year-old preachers in the street for all to see. <coughs> Yet we have terror tyrants trouble on the home fronts, in the alleys, in the gutters, schools, and malls for target practice, bombs, and massacres. This is a terror they're not stopping, won't acknowledge it. There is a problem with American consciousness, mock democracies without a sense of ethics, too much greed. This is all I see. They are terrorizing me with a war on terror on foreign grounds by pretending that the terror in Itat's Yunis isn't actually happening. It is. I'm living witness, and so are you. Thus, so are we. Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, how about Mumia, Peltier, and all those in between that we don't know about because, again, it isn't happening. The first casualty of war is truth. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. You're thinking Fahrenheit 9-11, I'm thinking V is for vendetta, but they don't know my name as I choose rebellion quietly. Gestapo on loose to filter through my conversations, messages, texts. Polly said, stay off the phone, but I can't stay away from paper and a pen. Tools of hope, use more for propaganda, and the noose of multimedia. Don't go asking any questions. Tyrants, trouble, tirades, terror. The war on has worn on for too long. Before Eric Gardner got the Hulk Hogan, Black Lives Matter. Hear me clearly, the disaster of Michael Brown's death didn't signal a new day. Black men getting shot, that's Tuesday. Wednesday, repeat the same thing. The tragedy is the million brothers on a chain gang. Soda highlight too, sound like some kind of lame game. Brothers get the Ariana Grande, bang bang. Before they would shoot me for selling Lucy's, they would hang me for my whistle, same movie. Different cast, same directors. To mortuaries and penitentiaries, they direct us. From slave ships to now, they still select us. If he's a problem at five and he can't read a sentence, on him, keep your eye, cause he gonna need a sentence. Evidence or no evidence, brothers are convicted. I am optimistic cameras can create caution, but I question a system that profits not off rehabbing. Rather, how many bodies are locked up, cameras can't stop much. Anybody with two eyes can see black lives matter, how true indeed, but ain't no good on the street, he can't breathe, you gotta keep a brother breathing, then ching ching. A system that has sent millions away, to, a system that has spent millions a day to lock brothers up won't raise a minimum wage. They quit to give a brother a minimum stay in a prison today, so what sticks in the change? Sean Bell got hit with 41, Diallo got hit with 41 shots. Sean Bell got 50 shots in his drop. Ronnie King got beat and everybody saw, everybody marched and everybody walked. Let this be something to consider. When they addressing you as a, when the world turn they back, you wanna give up? That's the time, it's time to throw your fist up. This is big boy talk, my saints, please have a listen. When the world turned cold, you got the shivers. So they got you working for the man like Doc Rivers. Or when 12 year old kids is getting hit up. Or ain't no jobs and execs on seven figures. Or ain't no sunshine singing Bill Withers. That's the time we gotta remember, not a justice system, but God is gonna deliver. Arrested and you pick up, the pot is gonna pick up all of the pieces. So when your back is splinting, we still raise our fist up. The righteous are the victors, God will avenge us. Something to consider. Thank you. in high school. I kept it pretty close, you know. We used to write raps when I was a kid growing up. We'd all stand on the corner and write our raps. I swear to God, that's where it all started. You get in a little cipher, you stand there in a circle, and who had the best rap was the best rapper. And it really is like an extension of that. It's mostly like you'd boast about yourself and how fabulous you are. Like, you know, I'm the best lyrically, essentially. All my raps were pretty much centered around how I was lyrically the best. And then I'd throw in a couple of 
Five dollar words to support such statements. <laughs> you know, there weren't a lot of girls in the cipher. Not a lot of girls on the corner throwing their wraps around. You know, I didn't write throughout high school, I didn't write. Until I turned 17. And when I turned 17, I had a friend. And this was in Manchester, New Hampshire. His name was Gary Victor. He was Haitian. He was my best friend. I lived on one block, and he lived on the other. We'd run throughout the whole day. We'd play school or basketball all the time. We'd just walk all over downtown, we'd crisscross the city, we'd walk down the train tracks and explore. We'd sit by the river all day and just throw stones and tell stories. And uh, in the summer of 1983, he died in a drowning accident. And we, I was devastated. It was just, I'd never experienced that sort of profound loss. And for some reason, I started to write them. I started to keep a journal. And I'm not sure, but I think my mother might have sent me to see the social. She said, why don't you write a journal? But that was the first time I'd really made the connection between putting lines on paper and that being able to help you stay in there. At the end of the day, how are you going to deal with whatever it is you're dealing with? How are you going to deal with the fact that maybe I want to drink today or man, I've been raising these kids for a long time and I'm tired, or, you know, my mother's a junkie, or whatever it is your deal is, I hate my job, my boyfriend beats me. How are you gonna deal with that? There's not enough food to eat. I skipped dinner so my kids could eat, you know? You're gonna write a song, or a poem, or you're gonna paint a picture, or you're gonna burn a stick and draw something with it. Like, whatever you gotta do to get it out, but that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna make art out of it, because if not, you're just gonna die. You're just gonna have to lay down and die, because you're gonna be the dog that somebody kicks when they get home from work and they're angry. So I'm much more interested in the imperfect the older I get. And maybe that's a product of age, you know? Maybe it's a product of this time, I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's just a, a product of looking for something more genuine, you know, and real and communicative that rises up out of the body in our bones. And this time where we're surrounded by language, which is ephemeral and useless, and you know, tries to <coughs> lie to us and tell us all these things. And I'm sure it has something to do with all that mixed together here in the 21st century. One of the things I love about Poets Hall is this represents everything that I think about politically, where just the people come together to create spaces of commonality and unity where borders and differences erase themselves. I mean, this is why this place is so special to me. And whenever I go on the road, I carry this place in my heart. And I carry yeah, all of no you. Fear here. Right, well, there's no fear. It's a beautiful place. Um, so I was raised in an Af uh, a mixed race family. My stepfather is African American. He's raised me since before I could even speak. And so I want to read a couple poems for him. And this is about when I was a, a little boy. It's called Danger Flammable. We were on a road trip. The brass buckles on blue coveralls, bright as metals, shining on the shoulder straps of that young man with his hair cropped, chewing spit as he pumped our gas. I was six, maybe seven, when my father opened the door of our rusty Chevy, his afro round as the moon, and that man glanced at my mother and said, that's a fine white woman you got in the car, boy. And the acrid smell, like a match being struck, as my father stepped up an inch from his eyes and whispered, that's mine wife and then took out his wallet and paid him then he started the car and drove us north toward ohio far away from that exxon sign just out sign d c and then, mostly I've been trying to uh, map this city in my life, you know, paying more attention to the daily, the daily street life, you know, Parade Street, West 26th Street, uh, children playing at the peninsula, uh, 
men leaning over on counters at the beer mug, you know, during a punk show. Every day is filled with enough beauty and sorrow to write a book. So we just pass it by. We try to stop passing, to slow down, to notice, you know, to love a little better, to be a little kinder. Which honestly is tough for me. I'm naturally, you know, product of my environment. Aggressive, a bit antagonistic, you know, very male. To be a little bit more forgiving. I tell you, your limbs with slivers of moonlight above Manhattan. And the scent of oranges and gin rose from your skin as I lifted your dress over your hips. Your red hair shaved to a narrow stripe. You ran your tongue slowly around my left nipple, arching your neck. Jazz drifted from the apartment below where Sirkowitz, the methadone saxophone soloist, bled notes. Only breathing to swig his Merlot to the rhythm of our bed springs, catching his riffs with expression, istic entanglement, chiming a rhyme we spoke all summer. I remember that shade you wore, plum jam above your eyes when you lied your old man was dead and I asked you to marry me and you said never. Lit a match and watched it burn down to your fingertips before you told me he still lived in New Jersey. I should have known then you'd flit wearing that blonde wig on the train. You'd say, hey, baby, I'm Billy Holiday. Kiss me. Your lipstick words were like love letters blowing along the East River on those nights we walked holding hands. I really believed we'd never die, saved in the sway of passing headlights. The street Sinatra sings with sonatas, sambas and mambas by Puerto Ricanos, the countries we count on radios, windows where Latin girls leaned, still as Vermeer's, or that eggplant you stole from the corner bodega, baked into what turned out to be Sirkowitz's last supper, before he plunged back into the needle, and we buried his sacks with his suit, but we could never replace those notes, though you tried sometimes after sex, you'd mouth a few phrases in a key, become minor, but the chord, we're all wrong, and we fade, and we fade, and we fade. I must admit, for a long time, I forgot. But strangely, last night, on the way to buy gin, I passed a woman with short red hair and a skip in her walk. And I swear, in the air, I smelled oranges. And the moon appeared. So God damn. Trouble with poets is they talk too much. The trouble with poets is they talk too much.